Hello, Bhavan. But people know um, the rules for the for the talk, and we can move from there. So, hi everyone. My name is Cindy from Faraja Cancer Support. I'm very excited this afternoon to invite you to our afternoon class on breast and ovarian cancer. We have a specialized speaker, Bhavan Bafsar from MP Shah Hospital, who's going to take us through this session. We have a few housekeeping rules that we'd like you to adhere to from now until the end, just so that we can make sure that the process is seamless. The first housekeeping rule is all participants, except the, the, the speaker, will be muted. This is so that we can avoid any atmospheric sound. Maybe you're listening in at a garage or in a matatu, so we don't want to interfere noise-wise. So that is why everybody is unmuted. Um, we'll have a question and answer session, but you can already start posting your questions as a form of chat. So in your chat, um, if you can see at the bottom of your screen, depending on whether you're using a laptop or a mobile phone, there's the option of chat. Please select chat to everyone so that we can see as the hosts and we can be able to moderate your questions to our speaker. The third house rule is um, if you're signing in with a device, for example, Nokia, Techno, iPhone, um, please change the device name to your name so that we are able to add you appropriately to our database and we are able to address you by your name and not call you iPhone or Techno. So thank you so much for this session. Um, my name is Cindy. I'll be helping Bhavan moderate, but Bhavan is going to be our speaker. And at this juncture, I'd like to welcome him to start our session. Thank you, Bhavan, and thank, thank you for doing thank this you. for thank us. Thank you, Sana. Hello. Hello, all good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bhavan Bhavsan. I am a specialized physical therapist at Ambisa Hospital. I am also the, the Radist of Res Cancer Rehabilitation Specialist working in Kenya. Uh, and also, as we know, like today, we are just uh, talking, I'm just setting my screen. Okay. Uh, so let's start. Uh, Judy, can you able to see this? Just confirming. Hello? Uh, yes, yes, I can. I can see. Oh. Okay, yeah. it's fine. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we just go turn by turn. We are just starting with the with the breast cancer and the therapies, and then we move to the ovarian cancers. Uh, rehabilitation is a very important part in cancer care, and I'm sure that everybody are more aware about it. Uh, let's just see that how the rehabilitation can be the part of uh, cancer care. So like physiotherapy can help to improve the fitness, reduce pain. Uh, it can also improve your strength, confidence, your, your energy level, quality of life and balance and coordination. Most of the cancer, post-cancer survivors, they have a issue with fatigueness, pain. They, they also have a like a problem of like speech or depending upon the uh, the site of cancer, the, the problem arises. So uh, let's begin with the breast cancer. So like everybody knows uh, that like one in eight, in eight women can be a breast cancer survival, okay, globally. And it is uh, one of the most common cancer. Breast cancer is the most commonly occurring cancer in the women generally, and uh, there were around 2 million new cases in 2018, and almost around 40,000 Kenyan annually affect with the same cancer. Uh, 
it's not always that only the women can get it even even the men can also get the cancer and every year around 2000 also diagnosed with cancer also uh our cancer rehabilitation is a program that generally helps as a whole of a human being which which makes the 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 person well in sense of physically cognitionally socially and most importantly emotionally uh what rehab does generally so like if somebody asks me i can just tell them that they start with mobility then we just need to counsel the patient about their goals their aims and where they need to reach it there are different modalities to be given for something like pain relief and now we need to increase the strength and the and the fitness also the now the type of cancer generally for the breast cancer it is mainly diagnosed with the fi type i will not go deep into the uh, this particular part because like this session is mainly for the rehab parts so i will talking more about the rehabilitation and then we we we'll see that how the other question as arises so uh, it just mainly like five type of cancers uh, is like ductal it is invasive inflammatory it is triple negative and it is now metastasis when the same it is now developed in some other area of the body most bothering signs symptoms i'm sure that like most of the survivors will agree with me about this and even for the research is saying that that these are the most commonest side effect uh, what they get it maybe after chemotherapy or maybe after radiotherapy so so the most common is nausea vomiting diarrhea neuropathy hand foot syndrome and mucositis uh, uh, i'm sure that hand foot symptoms and all that may not be so hard but i will talk more about the same in a in in a uh, future slides now just let us understand that okay what is cancer i'm sure that most of you and the they must not having an a clear idea that about what is cancer all about and like most of the cancer survivors they have like the problem with bone pain hair falls skin lining problem and some issue with the stomach why this arises actually so let us understand first that what is cancer uh, generally when there is a normal cell okay uh, it will not able to replicate by itself and when that particular mechanism it call as a contact inhibition when the cell is not able to control that division then the cancerous cell arises so why the chemotherapy causes the side effect because there are a few cells in our body which is always growing and that may be the only reason that all this chemotherapy and other drug treatment causes mainly hair bone marrow and the skin problem so like normal cells stop dividing when they came into the contact with like other cells and this mechanism is contact inhibition and this particular inhibition is lost by the cancerous growth and such we get all of the problem with hair bone marrow skin and the digestive system uh, uh now for the breast cancer i can just divide this six issue on a physical component right as a musculoskeletal it may be the pain maybe the fatigue other is the neurological impairment it may be something like a nerve pain or maybe sharp burning pain shooting pain many of the like clients they have a bit of cognition impairment also after the surgery if any kind of frozen shoulder any kind of a lymph tissue injury it can also cause maybe lymphedema and all that comes under the surgical impairment cosmetological any particular skin issues and all that and of course about the behavior impairment uh, we need to ask this question until we we go further i'm sure that like most of you must be aware about these problems and how it it can be treated but still let us just brief about it that if any survivors is here okay what type of surgery is done what was their previous fitness or what was their previous status what was their post surgery status and how 
how much they have been impaired because of pain because of non movement because of some some other issue was there some drainage inserted or not if then how long and now where is the location then of course their side if if it is a right side a dominant person if it is if, if the surgery is done or or if the right mastectomy is done then of course the the right upper limb movement must be impaired and which causes a lot of problem another thing if any chances of getting an inflammation or something and how early they have started the rehabilitation i'm seeing in kenya that the rehabilitation is not started as soon as possible and they come up with uh, so many problems because they come after maybe a month or two and which creates a lot of complication for them more so earlier the rehab is better i will just share a few slide later on where it is more that how uh, how we need to start exercises and and what are the common exercises almost 62% of population at least suffer for a one impairment and 27 will be having a two to four impairment in six years so ideally after any surgical procedure almost more than half of the population they impaired with one particular function either it is a frozen so that it is some neck pain either some leaf limb issue either is some arm swelling either is some or some other pain uh now the main causes of pain in breast so the first like like most of them they have maybe a now pain because of uh, after the surgery uh, the chances of getting the now compression it is it bit higher and which causes a pain the second is the soft tissue pain maybe the muscular pain uh, due to inactivity after after the operation or maybe some kind of other stretch and maybe the the positional pain third is the bone pain when generally it is happen if a bone marrow has got involved or maybe it is some kind of other metastasis also the other thing is phantom pain phantom pain is a pain when there is a no body part but still you feel that it's it's there so it's something like if if there is a mastectomy done still there is a no breast on that particular part still like someone will feel that i i have that and i feel my breast very itchy so now that particular type of pain called as a phantom pain let's start with the mainly the musculoskeletal impairment uh, just uh, start with pain shoulder movement is tension you are uh, you are swelling on your arm or or maybe arm pitch or maybe there is a tightness of scar tissue in axilla or maybe upper limb ache or maybe the weakness the pain of the the shoulder after the mastectomy it is due to the lymphedema and also the non movement part after the surgery after the surgery the the movement should start as soon as earlier depending upon the, the requirement and uh, and the instruction by the medical or the the surgeon the the movement is to be started as soon as possible in 24 hours it is not required to immobilize your hand for long otherwise that can cause the 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 shoulder to be frozen and it can also impede your lymphatic drainage and that can also cause a lot of other problems later on uh now this is pms is most commonly post mess mastectomy pain syndrome which is more common in most of the mastectomy clients and there is a lot of theories behind it but it is still not profoundly research and still a bit of confusion but it's mainly from the now or from from the bit of sensitization of the now and uh, the risk is more higher when it is done of the three particular systemic management either it is a maybe a lumpectomy or maybe a radiation or, or maybe a chemotherapy so almost if they have done this three the the chances of getting this syndrome is almost 33% and it is more commonly affected axilla 
or the armpit. The, the chest wall and others are not uh, much affected, but other things are more affected with the same. Uh, let's just start uh, the pain part. Uh, the, the site of pain would be intercostal area. Intercostal is your the area in between your two ribs. Uh, mainly there is when there is any particular nerve injury, our, our nerve heals, but it never heals the same way as natural. So now that particular adhesion also causes a bit of scar and that also produces a, a the pain. Uh, many times there is a, the pain as I told about the phantom brace pain or, or the nipple pain or maybe some other issue from the nerve itself. Now the axillary vein syndrome, it is a very common issue which we encounter uh, with, uh, with the mastectomic lines. Uh, it just kind of the rod, what you feel underneath your armpit, even if you can just feel it, you can feel it, it's a tight rod, uh, which is mainly on the inner part of your armpit and that can go up to your lower down, up to your upper arm also. And it causes a lot of impediment in your shoulder movement, also with the with the with the movement of your neck also. And many of those clients with the same syndrome get the trouble with the uh, also with the neck movement. So we advise them also to do a bit of neck stretches so that it can also help to prevent the neck stiffness later on. Uh, Chemotherapy it is again like chemo is mainly not of course a good drugs, but it is of course to be given by force when it is needed. So now with the new uh, research is nowadays the the targeted therapies are available. Well, it is only targeted for some particular area, which is more uh, much more available now in a developable or maybe ovary cancer and something because ovarian cancers we can give a new adjacent chemotherapy where it is only be given for that particular part before the surgery or or it can be given like intra peritoneal chemotherapy so but uh, for the breast cancers it is it is mainly for the generalized chemotherapy which can also involve a lot of side effects and almost 30 to 40 percent of the chemotherapy clients uh, they develop the neuropathy neuropathy it is it is just a terminology uh, which is the inflammation of the nerve and, and then which can cause maybe burning sensation pain tingling sensation or or the pain around your arm which can cause a lot of discomfort and uh, Many of these clients, they have a complaint that the pain increases when there is a cold weather or maybe at night. Uh, that because of whenever there is a cold, okay, there is a vasoconstriction of the arteries. So the, the blood supply and the circulation is now reduced and that causes a lot of trouble. Now, let us understand about, uh, about the uh, on neuropathy. Uh, the symptoms is, as I told you, uh, it called uh, that are now which again transfer to the organs and again, again to the muscles. So, like, like so many. And now, which can also be arising to, to the organs and it can also supply to the muscles. So like many times there is a referred pain, if that's also, so now that particular muscle is also affected because the nerve supply is the same. So the symptoms of neuropathy can be pain, numbness, maybe the loss of balance, hypersensitivity, or maybe the weakness, dizziness, or, or, or they cannot be able to do <coughs> A bit of fine movements like uh, uh, maybe holding a pen or maybe uh, rolling a chapati or something like that. Now, hand foot syndrome, as we talked about earlier, uh, 
it is also called as a uh, erythrodysarthria, which is it causes the redness, swelling, and pain in your palms and hands. Again, the again the physiology is not much assessed, but if you see our 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 hands and our our feet, both of them are covered with the end arteries. We call as end arteries in which there is a no particular collateral supply to other arteries. So all the arteries are ending in our hand and in our foot. So where there is a no particular collateral, the the chances of vessel constriction means like constricting is higher in in our feet in our hand. Even in like cold weathers, we feel more cold in our hands and our feet. Now, now this is the the same physiology. It can be also applied to hand and foot syndrome. Uh, the client they can feel like swelling, sensation, tingling, maybe a the the skin issue, maybe pain, or, or they complain of maybe a issue with the walking and and the or using of your hands also. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> the, the most common chemotherapy drugs can cause uh, the, the nerve issue. It is mainly uh, erubin is like cispetilin, vinorabilin, and docetaxel. I'm sure that like most of the, the client, they must not aware about that which drug has uh, has been given to them, but if they really know, uh, and if it is mainly from this particular uh, drug's name, they the, the chances of getting the no problems are more. So even they can start uh, doing a few exercises and and they just prepare their mind for the same. So it can also give a good uh, a feedback loop channel to just prepare their mind for the pain. Now, these are a few drugs, which is, uh, I guess, much in details. But if you just need this, I can, I can just add the, the resolution later on. Uh, the, the peripheral neuropathy can be great in a four way. Uh, and most of the time, they don't get any trouble doing their daily activity, which is for just grade one. When they feel it that they are just trying uh, to get a bit of difficulty in their in the daily activity, like uh, like preparing a meal, uh, meal maybe is going out for shopping or or to just uh, or reading a books or something. That is what you call as a moderate one. In a severe one, when there is a large particular movements, when it is affected, maybe opening a door or maybe uh, not throwing a ball or something. So now that is the grade three. And the last one is when there is a lot of trouble and uh, even there is so much hypersensitization where even you cannot touch a person because you no, know, he feels uh, that the skin is so hypersensitized because of the nerve issue and then it comes as a life threatening. So, so these are the very few tips to, to just manage the post chemo neuropathies. So just try to be more safe. First of all, due to the, the chemo and uh, other, other management of cancer, there is a low immunity. And of course there is a low platelet count. So the, the chances of getting bleedings are very high. And and uh, due to low neutrophils and like like few other medicine can also cause low of immunity. You need to be more safer, uh, moving around and and just try to like, wear the whole clothes. Okay, do not walk uh, bare feet. Uh, you need to hydrate yourself well. So just try to have a good amount of water. A good amount of water could be around two to two point five liter of water a day. Try to uh, keep away your, uh, keep away yourself from uh, sharp edges and the the wet clothes. Do not uh, expose your hand uh, and your feet to too cold or too hot. Uh, 
try to wear the clothes if you're handling any kind of star pages or something and uh, if you feel dizzy or something you, you need to be first prepare your body for the movement try to pace yourself do the movement slowly so that you can do not fall because falling in again uh, is a trouble and it can also uh, make you again back to the hospital but let me tell you there is no permanent or no proven cure for peripheral neuropathy we get so many like client asking that uh, taking vitamin b12 or or maybe taking some other uh, supplement can help us but it's not the permanent solution ideally when there is the nerve issue it is always something that is not always a sure treatment it is just a supportive treatment and again the the vitamin b12 absorption rate in our stomach is very less it is just around 2% so if you take around 100 medicine only two gonna work on you so even it's not so effective all the time but yes it is not the proven assured treatment but it is just a supportive one uh let's understand that how it will improve so uh, we can enhance mobility flexibility and strength by doing a different joint mobilization exercises if it is needed and if there is a need of doing anything passively it can be done with the soft tissue manipulation maybe something like a passive joint mobilization for the strength training we can just try to increase a bit of weight training functional movement and there is a also we need to work out on your fitness and aerobic capacity it is not always needed to do the exercise as consigned and you need to understand your routine lifestyle how you being in which environment do you live is not suggested that if you uh, if you have not done any swimming before your uh, before your cancer it is not mandatory to just start swimming for your aerobic even you can walk even you can jog even you can just climb the stairs for the for the pain and sensation we can give a electric stimulation there is a different modalities like shock wave therapy and other things are also available uh for the swelling it is mainly for the limb edema therapy uh, compression stocking gloves uh, we'll come into this about stocking the the type and like what to wear or what not to wear and what is the congestive lymphatic therapy uh, if you do all this thing of course it will improve your quality of life uh because it will also improve your sleep and that's how it will improve your like, quality of life and your mobility and now you can more involve in your social uh, parameters and that makes you more happy every exercise should uh, concise this six factors so so the first is the pain management second is the flexibility third is the circulation fourth is the strength fifth is your cardiovascular management and the sixth is your subjective individual impairment type of management so let us just understand that uh, once we are done with the mastectomy or any kind of breast surgery okay what are the common exercise we need to do each in and away from the hospital so as you can just see on the screen the, the numbers are from uh, from your left to the right if you can just see 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 pictures and uh, i've just documented the exercises how you need to do it for week wise so if you have been done the mastectomy from the first week you can start doing six exercises as as soon in first two line of the uh, the chart so now this exercise needs to be repeated minimum twice a day at least 10 or 15 times each you need to pace yourself maybe for the 
first time you cannot able to do the 20 repetition or or maybe like 10 repetition it's okay you need to pace yourself there is no thumb rule for the same but according to your capacity your fitness you need to start growing it and progressively increase the repetition and the exercises so like first all these exercises are involving maybe for only for the flexibility part there is nothing for the strengthening in this because first few weeks we are just trying to aim to get a good flexibility we cannot involve the strength part here on because that can also injure the surgery part and still the, the surgery part is still in a healing mode so uh, do this exercise nine exercise as much as you can in a daytime start slowly then you pace yourself and try to increase your reputations as i told you that first we just involve the, the flexibility so these are the few more flexibility exercise which can involve your arm and the leg also so like like few of the exercises are for the calf for your upper back it can also improve a bit of your shoulder and the shoulder blade mobility it can also give a bit of strength to your knee also because if you are just trying to just do a squatting or something it can also improve your knee strength all other exercises are for the flexibility and the strength so these exercise you can start doing from the third week of your post mastectomy it is not always that this needs to be done only after post mastectomy even if you are just done a chemotherapy or radiotherapy you can still go on with the same exercise because it involves the same principle and unless it is not specialized subjective some complication otherwise this exercise can be done with all of the clients okay and again you need to start yourself slowly and just pace yourself once you are done with all the flexibility and a bit of light strengthening exercises you can move to the the bit of strength one so now these are the few example of the like strength exercises uh, you may not always need the accessory for the same even if you don't have the dumbbells you can do it with the maybe a one or two liter of the water bottle and again do the same exercise if you don't have maybe something like a elastic band again you can do the same with the any particular weights or anything the the third exercise it is also for the upper back okay and this strength training needs to be started minimum of 6 weeks post your surgery or any complication is arises you need to meet the the therapist before starting the exercises he or she will guide you that how often and how to do the exercise and how progressively you need to add other exercises so these are the most commonest exercise what you should include in your routine regime and uh, which can help you to involve all the muscle group of your body and that makes you feel more better more flexible more strengthful as i told you that fatigue is again the the main complication after cancer you need to start slowly and pace yourself uh so we are just done with the a bit of flexibility part let's just just move for the lymph i'm sure that like 80% of the breast cancer and other cancer survivors they get the lymphatic problems in a in a general terminology a lymph is is the our drainage system uh, we just drain the dirty things from our body and just flush it out in a in a in a different fluid out of the body if we don't have this system up to the mark it can now arising a problem with the drainage and it can cause maybe swelling maybe pain maybe your skin is very shiny tight and then again compromises uh, the circulation because our body is a closed compartment 
even if there is a, any swelling in a in a compartment that can also produce a lot of of the compression in our body and which can again uh, give a lot of complication so lymph is a milky fluid that contains the white blood cells uh, lymph vessels like a blood vessel run all through the body it, it the, the main area of the, the lymphatic it is mainly from axilla as you can see in the in the picture it is uh, mainly in axilla it is it run through the the brachia okay so now have this uh, like call as a brachia and this it call as a iliac so so for the breast and the, for the ovarian cancer uh, why most of the clients they get the problem of lymph edema it is because of this because the whole the main channels of the lymphatic drainage okay or or we call as the lymph nodes and and the lymph uh, a tissue system it is much concentrated at axilla and around the pelvic area what is lymphedema lymphedema is just a collection of the fluid lymph inside the lymphatic system the nodes are mainly as we told you that is mainly like axilla and another management of lymphedema the, the first thing is if there is a profound lymphedema uh, management specialist he can just start with the complex decongestive therapy before all that you need to be more flexible so everything needs to be started as a process it should not be start just lymphedema but first you need to get a good flexibility and then you move towards slowly slowly some other things if you start only with your lymphedema and if you don't have a good flexibility it can again compromise your lymphedema treatment so it's just like a the combination of treatment anyone will not get to work well so just try to understand that it is a it is a it's just a systemic approach where you need to involve every combination of every problem management so so for the lymphedema the, the most important is complex decongestive therapy the, the the sleeve and the and the bandages manual lymphatic drainage many of the time is called as a massage by the by the layman terminology but it's supposed to be a specific lymphatic drainage it is not the normal massage what we get so just try to differentiate that massage with the lymphatic drainage itself it is a specialized trained person for the same route does it and it's supposed to be the uh licensed for the same actually in a developed world there is a specialist therapies who does only this thing but like being in a developed world we don't have the much of the qualify professional for this so even we can train the the persons or the professionals here who can do this and again the uh, the skin and nail care the the goals is uh, to to promote a physical activity to to prevent the secondary complication if then if they require any accessories like arm sleeve arm sling or maybe some kind of other prosthesis we can also suggest the same and how we need to now follow up with the same so as i told you that physiotherapy or the lymph edema therapy is working as a core team with physician with oncologist with onco physician so all these things needs to be done and do a proper follow up so that so that we can also guide you to some other professional right okay so so now now what are the benefits so it can improve your circulation as our cancer survivors so do 150 to 300 minute of exercises per week if it is below 
one hour exercise a day is must for them to get them well or to keep the fitness well. So 150 to 300 minutes a week. Now, how you differentiate the exercises? Exercise could be anything. If you just manipulate or, or just calculate your heart rate maximum, Heart rate maximum is the maximum heart rate which you should do the exercise most effectively. So how to now calculate that? 220 minus your age, it is the most easiest way to get HR max. As an example, if my age is around 40, so my heart rate maximum would be around 220 minus 40. So it's 180. So I should do any activity in a daytime which increases your heart rate up to 180 is a good exercise. Either it could be climbing stairs, either it could be running, either it could be rowing, either it would be maybe cutting the tree, either it could be swimming, it could be anything. It just need to be reach your maximum potential of your body and thus you are maintaining your fitness by training your heart muscles and your body muscles to get more strength, flexibility, and the endurance. So as we like to talk about that, like uh, the techniques is all this thing, uh, I guess we have talked before, but now we'll just go in the detail. Only thing actually we have not talked is the, the compression machine. Uh, many of the Many few centers in Nairobi having this compression machine. Uh, this compression machine comes with the with the arm or leg sleeve and a very small machine which can just inflate and deflate the, the sleeve while putting the vacuum inside. So it's something like it is just compressing from outside. So, so as your inner pump is not working, Okay, we are just trying to get the outer prompt from away from the body and now just trying to press it. So this particular machines are not so expensive. You can buy it from outside. Uh, it may cost in Kenya around 80,000 to 100,000. So it's, uh, which is more easier if it is a, a chronic condition that uh, you should buy it if it is needed with the with the advice for any of the therapist. Now, as we talked about complex decongestive therapy, uh, this is evidence-based management and supportive system of lymphedema. It is the only evidence-based treatment till now. So it composed of mainly two phases. It just tried to decongest and then maintain again. And you need to maintain and again decongest. So what it involves? It first involves the exercises, which I will again share in the in the uh, the slides. Then you apply the the manual limb drainage. Then you again do the exercises. For the maintenance sake, now the therapist will guide or do the compression bandages. Then you go home and try to wear the normal compression garments like a stockings or sleeves. So it is when a therapist is doing the therapy, he or she will help you to do exercise, manual limb drainage, and the compression bandage. On the maintenance, you need to wear the stockings, try to do the skin care, and try to involve in a routine exercises. Now, if you are at home, and if you like to just do the, the normal exercise for the normal flow of limbs, these two are the most common as exercises which can help you to circulate the lymph in a normal manner. Uh, you just try to 
propose your arm in a clock and anti clockwise here in second you are just lying on a form roll or maybe some kind of a round cushion and then you are just trying to take your hand in and away out from the chest now even if you can see here if you have at home or maybe the, the therapist can help you to again do the exercise okay keeping the the, the stick or the or the wind in your hand over here you can just try to bend and straighten your wrist it can again help to just get the flow well so now these are the most common exercise which you can do it every now and then if you are working and it may take maybe two minutes every hour and that works well with the lymphatic drainage uh, whenever if, uh, manual lymphatic just the nodes are located as an example the nodes for the arms are located from elbow to your neck Mm -hmm. you're, muted. You. you're muted you're muted yeah can you hear me yeah yeah you can sorry so now so the general guidelines for these exercises is to just try to wear the very light clothes okay i do not wear any kind of tight clothes if you have like burning or numbness or something uh start doing all other exercise as we now talked about do this exercise five to seven times a day try to pace yourself don't do too much at once be sure that you do a, that you are not blocking or restricting your breath you need to keep continuing breathing normally again breathing normally is again uh, a good component of doing exercises okay many of the client they just hold the breath and, and they do it okay which is wrong so you need to try to breathe normally with all the exercise what you are doing uh, be careful you need to avoid or check the blood pressure on a regular basis do not put any hot or too cold on your chest or the back try to avoid the injection on the on the part of the lymphedema you need to discuss the exercises to the therapist or do the same as he or she advised you do not try to add by your own because you may not required or or other exercise are may not be safe for you so you need to be very careful for the same uh i having obesity and overweight is again again uh, a challenge which which you need to move it slowly any sign of infection like maybe like fever chills like uh, redness around the skin all the issue you need to inform the doctor urgently now uh, let us come about the, the compression sleeves as we talk about that the the compression sleeves or the stockings most of the times it is not known by the doctor or by the user or by the therapist itself the the compression stockings okay there are the two types generally how they now classify they classify as a day sleeve 
or day stockings or a night stockings and if it is now graduating or non graduating now now what is the difference between day and night sleep the the normal pressure of our arteries is supposed to be around 18 to 22 mm of hg now this particular pressure is our normal arterial pressure actually now this class 1 class 2 and class 3 is mainly now classify in regards to this particular resting pressure of our artery and veins so like most of the times the doctor prescribe class 2 stockings or arm sleeve so when they are described or tell you to buy this stocking you should know that the pressure of this particular stocking is supposed to be 23 to 32. When you're buying a stocking, you need to again confirm that if this is stocking graduating or non graduating. Graduating means whenever you are wear the stockings, the pressure gradients supposed to be the same all over your arm or leg. If you are wearing from your hand, so the same pressure is supposed to be allowed also around your upper arm. So it should be the same pressure what you are trying to get in your hand is the same at your upper elbow and up below the shoulder. So if it is not graduating, it may affect your circulation where it is more tight at your hand and more loose at your elbow and again which has got no use because we need to get a gradual pressure from, from distal to proximal component so that it can try to pull your swelling towards the axilla right the the day and night splints are more different but it is not so profoundly managed in Kenya or in the developed world. So we generally suggest to wear the same at night if it is comfortable. Again, the day and night pressure in our circulatory system are not the same. At night, the resting pressure is reduced. So we need to have the compression stocking or sleeve in that particular pressure. But though it, if it is not available, you can just try to wear the, the same stockings at night if it is comfortable to you. So whenever you are be suggested or buying this, you need to understand this concept. Now, uh, this is not authority, but to, to just minimize the, the cancer, you need to first try to share in communication, check weight, age well, away from the radiation, eat healthy. I guess uh, we are done with the, the breast cancer now and the, and the management. We are now moving towards the ovarian cancer. I'm sure that we will uh, we'll be having a, maybe a question and answer session at the last. Or, or if you guys have we, are having any question for the breast cancer? Right. Um, first of all, thank you so much for an amazing presentation. I've just been taking notes as well. Um, yeah. Very interesting, especially the part for uh, day and night sleep. Um, yeah. And for Dima, it really is a question that we have um, a lot of patients asking. So I feel that, yes, we should ask questions for breast so that when we move to ovarian, we, we you're not congested with too many questions at the end um, we have Anne joseph who asks how long does neuropathy last for someone who has had four chemos and zeloda what about hand and foot syndrome so i guess Anne joseph would like to know how long neuropathy would last if it goes away and her okay. particular situation she's had four chemotherapies and she's currently on zeloda she also wants to know how long does hand and foot syndrome um, last. She's also asking about lymphedema. Is there a timeline for lymphedema? She was told not to take hot showers, not to use hot water, um, a hot water bottle, sorry, and to avoid direct sunlight, especially because she's taking Zeloda. So she's asking, is this correct? 
Because right now the weather is very cold and she'd like to take a hot shower. She'd like to use a hot water bottle. But she was told not to take it, number one, because of lymphoma, and number two, because she's on the ladder. So maybe we can answer Anne Joseph before we move on. Yes. Uh, so as uh, rightly asked that for the lymphedema and uh, if there is the, the neuropathy, she should not have the hot sour. I can again tell that you can have the warm sour, but the hot sours are contraindicated. Hot water bottle is again contraindicated because your senses are already less. So you may not get to know that if it is too hot or it is too cold. So that's why for the protective side, okay, most of the doctors, they will not advise to have the hot sour or the hot water bottle. For the lymphedema, there is no particular timeline that when it comes or when it goes. Ideally, lymphedema, once it is happened, and if it is primary, it never go. It just be with you, okay? But you need to manage it and just try to reduce the same. It never go completely, first of all. And there is no particular guideline or maybe the timeline that when it comes. It can come maybe after, maybe a cancer, after a month, or it can also come maybe after 10 months. So it is all de depending upon the surgery, the chemo, the radio, and your flexibility, and your pre and post uh, surgery issues, and, and how you are fit, and, and how, how you are more flexible. For the neuropathy part, uh, again, it is not profoundly researched well that uh, when it comes and when it goes but it is again as i told you that uh, it needs to be uh, again research well and it's not confirmed yet so even uh, for the same the, the answer would be the same but uh, to to give a, a much more uh, a management strategy the pain is uh, is something that defined differently with the different people. So pain is just a perception. If you tell me that I have 100% of pain, every doctor or every therapist needs to agree with it. How you interpret your pain, it is very much important to get the good outcome. So now we call as a cognition functional pain rehabilitation, where we teach our clients that how to interpret your pain in a better way. So many other times, your other stressors of the life and of course your disease process can also cause pain without any particular pathology. If I don't have any pathology, even I can have pain because I may not be happy, right? So how you interpret your pain in a better way is again the good strategy to manage the cancer pain, okay? Which is now we, we just try to teach our clients that try to reduce your stasis. Okay, stasis, it could be anything. It could be maybe the, the, maybe the car accident or it could be your, your chemo is not working well. It could be some, some kind of other social emotional issues. So, so just try to reduce the stasis which you have in your hands and, and just try to interpret the, the pain in a better way and and just try to be more flexible, try to get a good advice from a good therapist, and I'm sure that will help you for your neuropathy. Yes. Any other questions? Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. Um, thank you, Anne Joseph, for the correction. She meant not for chemos, but intravenous chemotherapy. So it was IV, not IV, like the Roman letters. Thank you, Anne, for that correction. Um, Angela Nduku is asking, is bone density restored after you finish five-year um, five hormonal therapy? Uh, it is again now subject to subject. It is not always needed, but I guess your oncophysician or, or, or your oncologist must be, guide, uh, must be guiding on the same. Uh, 
due to the hormonal change, many times you are more prone to get the osteoporosis. So if you may have any symptoms or maybe like fatigueness or bone pain or any mobility issue with your spine or maybe like, like too much of back pain, you should uh, convey the same to your doctor and I'm sure that he will guide you for the best. But there is no uh, guidelines as such that after having this much like hormonal therapy, you must go for the bone scan. No. Okay. There is no much guidelines because it's not, uh, uh, it is again a bit of a costly affair. So not many doctors are also suggesting it, but it is all upon, upon a subjective basis. But as I told you, if you have any kind of these symptoms, kindly share with your doctor and, and then he will guide you to, to go for or not to go for. All right, um, I think that's okay for the questions now for breast cancer. Please keep the questions coming right now in the interest of time. Um, we yeah. will move on to ovarian cancer. Thank you, Baba. Okay, fine. Let us move to the ovarian cancer. Uh, ovary is, uh, is just the part of a female organ, organ system and uh, uh, it just comes uh, in like two numbers. The, the, the main function of to get the ovum is uh, uh, from the ovary and like so many other, other work also. So uh, let us just start with the ovary cancer. It has got uh, mainly the, the stages wise, if you just think it just stages in four stages generally, uh, how that it looks like. So uh, these two are the ovaries. Uh, uh, this is the, the female reproductive system. And uh, once you got the, the, uh, the cancer, the the cancer can also the uh, part of the ovary, the uh, the lining, the, the fallopian tubes, or or it could be the, the whole of uterus also. So if you can see, it is just on the lining of ovary, uh, where over here it is it is much more spread to the whole of ovary and again involving the fallopian tube also. So uh, mainly the the management of ovarian cancer yeah, uh, depending upon what the stages like most of the ovarian cancers are mainly diagnosed uh, at the uh, at the later stage because it is not much aware about uh, in, uh, in the in the in the uh, developing uh, nations and uh, it has been uh, treated mainly with the surgery and uh, uh, with the surgery also there are the uh, different surgeries done maybe if it is just ovary then they will just uh, now uh, remove the ovary if it is now again the fallopian tube they will again remove the, the tube or maybe the uterus as i told you uh, the early is better early detection of the ovarian cancers are better and and that come with the good prognosis and like mostly like uh, most of the ovarian cancers again clients that they, they get the chemotherapy but very rare clients they they get the radiotherapy also in a in a developed world they are moving around neo adjustant chemotherapy and they call it as a cyto reconstructive cancer surgery so the the plan of treatment would be something like once you get the diagnosis of cancer of ovary uh, they will first try to uh, now get the staging of ovary, okay, that in which stage you are in and now again it just come with the now grading 1, 2, 3, 4, which I am not now going into deep into it, but according to that they will now decide that I will be going for the chemotherapy before the surgery or maybe after the surgery. So if the, if the now the chemotherapy is given before the surgery, that called as the new adjustant chemotherapy. It has been given to kill the cells, okay, which is just at the out of the lining of the ovary. So when they remove the, the part of the, the tumor, many of the time the, the small cells, which has been also directed further to some other organs, are, are not uh, removed. So, uh, 
when we give the chemotherapy before the surgery, it is more effectively surgery done after that. So now the surgery is done, now called as the, the, the psycho reductive surgical management. And once they're done, they will again decide to give chemo or not. And now it is only, uh, now the chemotherapy is also been given by intraperitoneal, which is more easier. And now uh, the now the complication chances are again less with the same particular type of treatment. And as I told you that very rarely it has been gone for the radiotherapy. The, we'll just go through with the main complication after the surgery and then a bit of exercises. For the lymphedema, the exercise would be the same with all. But I'm sure for the other part, we'll just discuss. So the, the option uh, after the COVID and cancer. So the, uh, now the type of ovarian cancer are mainly four. The, the first is epithelial, germ, stromal, and borderline. Epithelial cells are the most commonest of ovarian cancers. And now that has been treated by doing the surgery mainly. And uh, now the second is again with the, with the surgery and chemo. Stromal is not so common cancers, but again, it has been followed by chemo and targeted therapy. And the, the bottom line, they generally do not need the surgery. Many times they need some kind of chemotherapy, which has been decided by the oncophagician. The clinical presentation of ovarian cancers, it has been proven that over 50 aged women are more affected with the same and they represent or like presented the, the bloating of abdomen or maybe some kind of abdominal mass or maybe back pain or maybe feeling full quickly or maybe they have a bit of pain around the abdomen, maybe pain during the urination, many of the time they feel a bit of shortness of breath and like most of them, they have a weight loss. So these are most commonest uh, features what the ovarian cancer like survivors, uh, they get before getting the, the cancer fully. Now the, uh, now the main problem after the surgery, uh, as I told you, it is, Again, depending upon the, the site of surgery and the, and the part of affection. If it is only ovaries affected, then the, now the reproductive system is now lost. So maybe the, the conceiveness, it may be the problem. If it is only affected only one ovary, then the, the chances of getting conceived are higher. So with the young clients, they get to done only single ophorectomy. That means they will just remove the one ovary at a time and they will let the other ovary, which is not much affected, they let the uh, a woman to conceive and then they again review after the birth of a baby and then we'll decide that if they need to again do the surgery or not. So again, it is very important and and are very critical that which age and which period of the life they get it. And they need to discuss with the, with the doctor that, that what is the plan and how they need to go about in future so that now the doctor will again suggest or guide that, that what are the other treatment options. Uh, most of the plant, they get uh, the infections after surgery. So now these are the most commonest complications after the surgery. So as I told you, the, the, the first is infection. Is, uh, it may represent uh, maybe with fever, with pain, body ache, fatigue, all other things. Second is vaginal bleeding, which is uh, uncommonly uh, uh, after menopause. Uh, third is uh, bleeding in your abdomen and pelvis. Many of the time they need to open the abdomen because if any pelvic organ or other part of the body is affected, they need to again uh, resection the affected part. So 
And when they open the abdomen, you need to understand that how to manage yourself by mobility. As an example, if they've done the laparotomy, uh, laparotomy is just like opening your of, of your abdomen. Uh, when your surgeon does the surgery, many of the times you you need to be more precisely mobile yourself. If you bend yourself forward, that may get your abdomen to bleed more because whenever you do any activity which can increase the intra-abdominal pressure is like lifting heavy something or maybe like bending down or maybe just got up on a abrupt places so all this particular position may increase your intra-abdominal pressure and that can affect the operation site and then the and then the chances of bleeding much be more higher now the fourth is your uh, bladder and bowel problems. Many of the uh, clients, they get uh, the, the problem of incontinence also. And mainly it is bladder. Bowel, very less when it is involvement of the uterus and when they need some surgery and uh, like uh, any, any nerve is now injured or something which can lose the sensation of bowel or bladder. And then it can cause the incontinence. For the incontinence, we need to work on the pelvic floor muscle, which I will uh, I will come through on a later slide. Fifth is the, the blood clots. Nowadays, the, like most of the surgeons, uh, they put uh, the client on the uh, blood thinners, and uh, so the so the chances would be a bit uh, lesser. But one needs to be more mobile as earliest after the operation so that they can also prevent the blood clots and and the swelling in your leg again this swelling in your leg is mainly caused by the lymphatic drainage problems as we just talked about earlier and again the again the treatment would be the same the the location it would be of course the change but but the decongestive lymphatic drainage system and the, and the management it would be the same with the same Now, now there is now two factor that again, if you have been on chemotherapy, again the uh, complication of the chemotherapy again arises. So the most common complication is fatigue. I tell most of them, my client, that you need to pace yourself, try to get energy, conserve techniques. As an example, if you are just holding maybe uh, maybe like a 10 kg in your hand, okay, just try to just distribute uh, the, the half on your both the hands. So distribution of the weight would be a good energy conserve technique. Uh, with the same, you can also try to do with other things like maybe like lifting any heavy weight or maybe pushing, pulling. So that way that will just save your energy. and that will not let yourself to go on fatigue stage. Third and fourth thing is now nausea. Uh, nausea is again a very commonest problem of chemotherapy and, uh, and the bowel habits. Head loss as we now talked about earlier because uh, about this because of the cancer cell how it grows and all that so now head and bowel are more affected the infection chances, the joint and muscle pain, and the numbness and weakness again. As we talked about the joint and muscle pain, like many of the individuals, they have the dilemma the that having a joint and muscle pain, I should not move myself, which is wrong actually. Everybody need to understand that our body is made to be worked dynamically, is not made to be rested on the bed. So if it is advised by the doctor or by the therapist, try to understand and educate yourself that you need to be more mobile, more flexible. Do not try to be in bed. Even with the common low back pain, you nowadays we advise our clients to do exercise. It is not required to be in the bed for more time because that will again enhance your pain. So don't think that Having a bit of the pain, if I rest, it will go. 
in a in a certain time yes you need to make your body more adopted and just try to be more mobile so that it can it can be better now let us understand the pelvic floor uh, as we just talked about that now pelvic floor it uh, it can cause maybe urinary incontinence or maybe some kind of bowel problems after the ovarian surgery uh, ovarian cancer surgeries so as you see this this is the the main okay pelvic floor it is just holding all of the organs in like female it is just holding from the from the tailbone to your pubic bone at front and now these are the the group of muscles which is upholding the all the organs and just try to relax when it is needed so that now we can able to defecate or even now we can able to now urinate so now these particular small muscles are very important muscle in our body even whenever we try to stand or from a sitting position okay these are the first muscle to start acting first okay so now now we just see a few things about this muscle and uh, yeah so so as we just talked about that the the main aim of the pelvic floor muscles is is to just hold the the organ give the balancing movement also give a support to diaphragm to have a good breath right so how it works generally when we just take a breath okay this thing will contract and and when we just take out our breath when we exhale again it just propels down with all the pelvic floor exercises breathing and your diaphragm breathing exercise are very much important do not try to hold your breath or do not try to uh breathe in a abnormal way because this exercise can only be done if you are breathing normally if you don't breathing normally the 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 purpose of exercise will not be solved now the i just tell all the people about this a pelvic floor a muscle education first thing is to feel do not try to just start doing the exercises without understanding it first thing is to feel your pelvic floor even if you just put your both the hands under your bums and and just try to squeeze your bums okay it is the most easiest way to feel your pelvic floor or how we just hold all the urine or stool it is again a good way to feel the pelvic floor muscle if you don't feeling it if you don't have the feel and then you strengthen it it never going to work well so now these are the four stages of feel aware strengthen and repeat all the exercise needs to be done in a correct technique as been told by the expert therapist assume that you have a good tone and just try to improve the tone with the exercises no abdominal muscle it's supposed to be the lower abdominal muscle contraction like like most of the time we see that now clients are doing exercises but but they does with the abdominal muscle not with the uh, not with the pelvic floor so maybe the uh, expert therapist will guide that how to now differentiate this or how to manipulate your pelvic floor muscle better than the abdominal no diaphragmatic bracing so you should not hold your breath if you hold your breath that works that you are holding your diaphragm and your pelvic floor muscle contraction it is not as as we want for the exercises again we are not in race so there is no competition you need to pace yourself these are the very small muscle which gets tired so early so you need to start slowly and progressively as per your comfort level so just try to repeat then you try to get more endurance then you just time yourself let me just uh, just see this video 
it just for around six minutes it will show you that how to do the exercise for the bladder and bowel control and and also for the incontinence okay so just uh, see the same i will be back in a few minutes yeah So now these are the commonest uh, exercise for the pelvic floor, which you can do it easily at home. So I just try to understand. If you get any uh, any question, I can ask it uh, at the end. <clears throat>
If I can just ask um, anybody who has a question as we watch the video, um, you can answer the questions. Um, I mean, you can post your question on the chat and Bhavan can be able to answer. In the interest of time, because I'm aware that it's 4 p.m. and we start at 2.30, maybe because um, we still have quite a bit to go with the video, we have um, two questions to add, yeah. um, two questions for you, Bhavan. So maybe yeah. we can have those questions and then we conclude with the video, just the remaining part, yeah. and then we can wrap up today's session. Yeah. Yeah. But it's been all very interesting. I think we can all agree. If you agree with me, just give a thumbs up. That's also a way of us to know that uh, you're still part of us <laughs> and you're still keeping um, and you're still being attentive. So Anne Joseph says, one side effect of chemotherapy is early menopause. Is this permanent? If not, are there tests to carry out to know if it's permanent or not? Well, I, um, you can answer that, but I do know menopause is permanent, <laughs> but um, I'm sure she just wants to know if chemotherapy is just a side effect. I mean, if menopause is just a side effect, like, is there a way that it can yeah, be? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yes, then we yes, have yes. Sophie who's saying, what is the difference between chemotherapy and target therapy? Please also state their difference in terms of side effects. Um, yeah. um, and Rosalind is also asking, um, she, I would like to echo Anne, is menopause permanent? So maybe we can have those questions and then we wrap up with um, Bhavan playing the remainder of his uh, video. Fantastic. Yeah, uh, for, uh, I guess, uh, I, so I'm not an oncophysician, but <laughs> I, I can just answer a bit that uh, targeted therapies are mainly like chemotherapy. It has been given as a generalized body component, right? If it is affected only maybe the ovary, your, uh, your chemotherapy is not only given to the ovary only. It has been given to the whole of your body. So your normal and your abnormal cells both are affected. While, while for the targeted therapy, we are just trying, as an example, that intraperitoneal chemotherapy, where we try to target the, the target organs, like as, in, as an example, ovary, where we just target the ovary and uh, we just inject the drug from the intraperitoneal route. And uh, that can minimize the, the side effect or minimize the uh, abnormal uh, uh, like a, that will just minimize the, the death of a normal cells. So it is just more targeted towards the abnormal cells while, while chemo is mainly targeted as a generalized normal and abnormal cells. Uh, the, the second question was about some menopause. Again, come, uh, yes, it the, was uh, about, um, so we have two ladies asking about this, Anne and Rosalind, and they're both asking, one of the side effects of chemotherapy is menopause. Is this permanent? If not, are there tests carried out to know if it's permanent or not? Okay. It, uh, it, if it is content to the ovarian cancer, I guess like most of the time the ovarian cancer has been diagnosed after menopause. Uh, generally, the uh, menopause as a complication generally happens after the hormonal therapy, not as directed as a chemotherapy. But due to chemotherapy, it can reduce the, the level of neutrophil and other, uh, other cells and the enzymes. It can cause menopause, but there is no particular test to give the timeline or to diagnose that if it is permanent or not. But generally it is permanent. In, uh, in, in this regards to the complication, Yes, it is, it is more permanent. Yeah. Okay, um, I don't see any questions. So without much further ado, I think you can play the recording. And then once the remaining part of the video is done, we can conclude today's session. Just give a vote of thanks. Um, I know there are a couple of people who take this opportunity to drop off. So I just want to thank you so much for being part of Paraja's online Zoom session. Um, yeah. or in, um, all participants of today's session will receive um, a recording of this as well as um, um, I can see Bhav and somebody asked you if you can share your slide and you said no problem. Yes, I guess uh, you can just follow uh, 
my social media also my website i will be now sharing all that even i just said before the presentation i have just had this exercise chart on the social media i guess uh, you can uh, you can have a look on that and uh, just keep following you will get all free information on the same so so this is just an example sample startup exercise regime that every cancer survivors can do it okay and this needs to be done on a regular basis on a, on a routine basis they should do it uh, so i guess uh, that is enough from my side i can just conclude if anybody uh, like to reach me they can email me they can call whatsapp they can go on my website which is bhavanbhasa.com they can just follow on on uh, uh, every social media i'm just there i'm i'm just sharing my own experiences all free health information on facebook instagram and all that so you can also keep following that yeah great so if you would like a copy of the presentation bavan has it on his social media platforms but for us as faraja we will send you a link of today's recording in case there are bits that you missed out so that you can have the maximum effect um thank you so much to everybody who has participated Uh, Judy, as my co-host, thank you for being the co-host and allowing people in and out. I don't know if you have any housekeeping um, information before we conclude, Judy. Yeah, I don't have any. I think you're okay to conclude. All right. Um, we have all your email addresses, so with your permission, we'll add it to our database. On behalf of Faraja and everybody, thank you, Bavan. Um, it's so. very, very, very informative. Even just the comments coming through from Lala, Roslyn, Monica, and Angela. They're saying this is a great session. Um, yeah. Even for me, learning about um, the different kinds of stockings and um, the side effects. It's really important for us as far as just staff so that we're able to assist our patients better. So, Bhavan, thank you again for taking Perfect. time out um, yeah. to be with us and to share the, the very vital information. We wish you all a blessed weekend and um please check your emails we're about to send our regular um uh, mailchimp e-shot to let you know of our therapies next week. Asante ni sana. Okay, fine. Nice time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.